the Trinity on this first Sunday of Advent as we begin to, to prepare to celebrate the birth of Jesus with hope and peace and love and joy. Welcome to everyone to our service today. I am in the sanctuary at Trinity United Church with Brookston and Addison, and they are looking for the church mouse. There is not much furniture in here, so you would think it'd be easy to find, but that mouse is tricky. They're not behind, it's not behind the pole. Is it hiding in that tree? Heather asked earlier if the mice, mouse hibernates. Where is he, Brookston? Do you know where that mouse is? Can you see him? Last time he was under the piano, but he's not there. He's not behind the pulpit. No. Where is that mouse? It's okay. No, he's not there. There he is, Brookston. Where is the mouse? Right in there. There's that mouse hiding by the stained glass. Right in there. Hello, little mouse. Happy Advent. Thank you, Addison and Brookston, for helping to find him. Yay! Welcome to worship on this first Sunday of Advent. Throughout the season of Advent, our theme will be holding hope. And we will look at what it means to hold hope as we move toward Christmas Day. I am Tracy Crick Butler, and I pray that you will join Trinity for all of the Advent services, and that even from your own home, you will feel, feel blessed to be part of the community. Thank you this morning to Dawn and Jean for their welcome to worship and to Addison and Brookston for helping to find the church mouse. Thank you to Marianne and Leanne for leading us in worship over the last two Sundays and to the many people who work so creatively to bring our online, to work, our online worship to life each week. This morning at 1130, we will celebrate the Sacrament of Communion over Zoom. The link for that is available on Facebook, or you would be able to find it in the email that I sent out to you within the last week. You can join on Zoom with your own communion elements, which might include bread and juice or cookies and milk or tea and biscuits or whatever it is that will help you to celebrate this special meal and to remember Christ who is always in our midst. As you are doing your planning for the month of December, please consider that the Ingersoll and District Inner Church Kettle Drive will be happening to help support families in our area. Trinity United Church has been asked to help staff the kettles on Thursday, December 10th and Saturday, December 12th, both days from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. If this is something that stirs your heart and you would like to participate in, we're asking you to sign up for a one hour time slot and you can do that by contacting Terry at the church office. Just a reminder, I would love to receive recordings of some of your favorite Christmas memories or traditions that you're willing to share. And I ask that you please email me with those before December 1st. During the season of Advent, our worship will be filled with beautiful and inspiring music. There'll be a time of Advent candle lighting, messages from Chelsea for our young people, and the opportunity to come together in prayer. Each week, we will also be called into worship by one of the people who would have been part of the Christmas story during biblical times. This morning, we are called into worship with the prophet Isaiah. Some people say I am an old fool. Others regard me with disdain as they don't want to hear my words. Some call me a prophet. God calls me Isaiah. And I seek to listen to God's word and proclaim God's message when he 
and speaks. Sometimes the message is difficult to hear, especially for those who have become comfortable with their places of privilege. Sometimes my words cause people to dream of better days to come. With all I have learned from God's word, as God's prophet, I hold hope deep in my heart, hope that peace and justice will rise up, hope for a time when nation will no longer war against nation, hope for a child who will be born to us, a son who will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, Eternal Father, and Prince of Peace. In this time of darkness, I hope that God is working in the world. Come, let us worship and hold hope together. I invite you to please join me in prayer. Advent God, it is with anticipation that we come before you on this first Sunday of Advent, and we hold hope in our hearts as we wait to celebrate the birth of Christ. This year, so many know the feeling of darkness, and we await your coming into the world and into our hearts. Open us to experience grace in unexpected places and inspire us to reach out in new ways so that the wonder of Christ's presence might be felt. Be with us, O God, and help us to hold hope for the world and for ourselves. Amen. I am hoping that you were able to pick up your Advent candles from the church, and if you were not able to do that, I encourage you to call Terry and set up a time. There are enough for all of our households. And so this is a wonderful way for us to continue to, to feel like we are together as we light our Advent candles. Even though we are not worshiping in the church during this season, we wanted to bring some of the sights of the church into your homes and where you are worshiping. worshiping. Thanks to Tina for creating a beautiful space for our Advent candle lighting. And this morning, our candles are being lit by Wilda, Mary, and Charlie. Today is the first Sunday in the season of Advent. Advent means coming. In this season, we are preparing for the coming of Christ. The Advent wreath is the shape of a circle. It has no beginning or ending. This reminds us that there's no beginning and no end to God's love for us. The candles tell us of the light that came into the world with Jesus Christ. The blue color of the candles symbolizes hope and anticipation. The pink represents joy and we light the white candle on Christmas Eve to signify the coming of Christ. This year, the need for hope feels ever more important. It has been a difficult year, and there have been many days that we have felt to be in the darkness. Today, we hold and live in hope as we seek out Jesus and prepare to celebrate his birth. On this first Sunday of Advent, we light the first candle in our Advent wreath and name it Hope. We wait in hope for God to break into our lives. With the lighting of this candle, we hold the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Please pray with us. O oh God, you so loved the world that you sent the gift of your Son to fill us with hope. Help us to hold hope dear in our hearts 
and inspire us to see and to be signs of Christ's hope in the world. Amen. From our various homes, let us join together in song. Welcome to Children's Time. This week we're celebrating the first week of Advent. But I can imagine that some of you are sitting through the service wondering, what does Advent really even mean and what is this season all about? Well, let me tell you. Advent comes from the word Adventus, which is Latin and means coming or arrival. So really we are officially entering a season of preparation. We are preparing for the birth of baby Jesus. This morning we lit the hope candle, which is one of three blue candles we will light this season. And there's a fourth pink candle, which we will also see. These candles are arranged in a wreath, which is a circle. And circles have no beginning and no end. The circle is used to symbolize God's love for us because God's love for us also has no beginning and no end. So as we move through this Advent season, search for these four important words, hope, love, joy, and peace, and you will find the magic of Christmas.
our scripture reading is taken from Isaiah 2, 1 to 5. The word that Isaiah, son of Amaz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come let us walk in the light of the Lord. This ends our reading. Many years ago, at about this same time in the year, as I was preparing for Advent, I came across a reading that I find again and again in my files. It was written by a well-respected theologian and preacher, Fred Buchner, written for clergy as they prepare for this first Sunday in Advent. Buchner writes, If preachers decide to preach about hope, let them preach about what they themselves hope for. If preachers are going to talk about hope, let them talk as honestly as St. Paul did about hopelessness. Let them acknowledge the darkness and pitiableness of the human condition, including their own condition, into which hope brings still a glimmer of light. And let them talk with equal honesty about their own reasons for hoping, not just the official, doctrinal, biblical reasons, but the reasons rooted deep in their own day-by-day -day experience. Let them speak out of the living truth of their own experience. The living truth of my own experience? On one hand, that sounds so complex and deep. And yet on the other hand, it's exactly what I know best my own experiences where I have witnessed hope in my life and in my ministry. And those times of despair when those I have walked with or, or, or I myself have experienced periods of drought or, or been on the edge of hopelessness. Buchner calls us to acknowledge the pain and speak with passion about what it means to have hope. And this year, I think that's even more relevant as we begin this season of Advent. What does it mean to light the Advent candle of hope when our world is in such a state? How do we make our way right now when nothing is as we might have imagined or anticipated or longed for? The pain, unfortunately, is easy to name. And not just with everything that happened with the COVID pandemic and, and what that means for each one of us. Illnesses have continued to plague our loved ones. Mental health issues continue to escalate. Many frontline workers are exhausted and businesses are not sure what new shutdowns will mean for their survival. And in the midst of all this, we know that social problems have not gone away. People are grieving the loss of loved ones. In some corners, hatred has increased and acts of violence have multiplied. Creation is crying out for healing. Yes, we know the pain. And for so many, the very idea of hope feels remote and beyond what we can conjure up in our hearts. The same could be said for the people in the time of the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. Nothing for them was going as they had imagined. The people of Israel had been living under foreign rule with oppressive social and political conditions that caused them to doubt God's presence. Isaiah spoke to the people of the time 
I spoke to the people of the time when God would bring peace to the world. And yet his words were difficult for people to hear. How could Isaiah speak to the people of hope? How today do we speak of hope? I speak of hope because like many of you, I have witnessed the light of Christ's love break in and have experienced God's presence in the darkest of places. I have walked with people through tragedies in their lives and have been amazed at where they have found hope. Somehow, without ever really fully understanding it myself, I hold hope deep in my heart because I trust that God is always with us. So this morning, I preach on hope. And perhaps the best place for me to begin is with another Sunday that was the first Sunday of Advent, 24 years ago. I'd been ordained in the spring and was ministering in Huron County. The Sunday morning, one week before Advent, November 24th, there was a car accident in Varna that involved six young people. Three of them were killed and three others were in hospital. The community was not only in grief, but in shock. These were their children that had died. One week later, some of those young people had already been to three funerals that week and were still praying for their hospitalized friends to get well. In a time of such intense grief and mourning, the first Sunday of Advent was upon us, and we were to light the first candle in the Advent wreath, the candle of hope. What's one supposed to do in a place where there seemed to be such darkness? And yet on that first Sunday of Advent, the candle of hope was lit by a young man who had lost one of his closest friends and whose best friend would die two weeks later. Still, no matter how difficult it was, he agreed that he could, that he could do it. I'll never forget that candle being lit. A light in the darkness, a sign of hope in the midst of tragedy, an assurance to everyone who was gathered there that day that God was near and would somehow radiate light and love into a situation where you might have believed none existed. Yes, in the darkness, we experience hope. My friend Kathy lives in the United States. And she recently worked for the census for six or seven weeks prior to the election. Her role was to get information from people who do not have internet or who had recently moved or who were living in impoverished conditions. While her car license plate still marked her as coming from Iowa, she was working in rural southeast Alabama. She, a white middle-aged stranger, knocking on unknown doors in the midst of a country caught in racial strife. Kathy described that Google Maps often did not know the addresses of the people that she was looking for as they were literally living in the wilderness. One evening as she struggled to find an address, an older black woman stopped her yard work to answer Kathy's questions and explained the directions. Seeing Kathy's blank look on her face, the woman put down her rake and her gloves. She got in her car and invited Kathy to follow her. The woman then drove Kathy several miles into the woods, took her right to the needed address, and then gave Kathy directions for how to get back to the highway and to her hotel. Hospitality to a stranger. Love for one who is different and and thought of as the other. Walls broken down, if, if even for a moment. Yes, even in the darkness, 
we experience hope. My husband teaches at a school where there is a great deal of poverty. While during the school shutdown in March, many were handing out Chromebooks and technical supplies to those who needed them. And his school was also distributing rice and sugar and eggs to family in need, families in need. And each year in December, this school does a food drive to help support the area food bank. And each year, from each year, children from families who have so very little themselves somehow find food that they're able to donate to those who they believe has have less than they do. Their generosity of spirit and belief in caring for others is extraordinary. Yes, even in times of darkness, we experience hope. I've been thinking a lot about hope lately, about how to maintain it in painful situations, how to inspire it for those who cannot see any hope in their own life, how to speak of hope as a minister and pastoral care provider without sounding trite or dismissing people's real experiences, how to hold hope myself when some days it can feel very difficult. Buchner challenges me as a preacher to speak honestly about my own reasons for hoping that are rooted deep in my own experience. And here's what I've come to understand. Hope doesn't mean that everything is okay or even that it will get better. Hope doesn't mean that life is easy or that we should turn a blind eye to the suffering and destruction and hatred in our world. Hope doesn't always take away the pain or remove the fear. It's not pie-in-the-sky denial. Hope is knowing that in the midst of it all, in the most challenging of places, we are not alone. God is with us in the darkness, oftentimes carrying us and always promising to never leave us. Hope is seeing even a glimmer of light that is enough to give strength for the day. Hope is witnessing people live in ways that share love and fill us with a sense that new life is possible. Hope is unexpectedly finding Christ and the work of God's hands when we least expect it. And in this season of the church year, in this Advent time, hope is being awestruck that rather than a big and powerful king, God sent a baby to transform the world. Hope is wise men following a star because they believed that at the end of their arduous journey, they would find something amazing. Hope is that more than 2,000 years later, people are still looking to that baby as the one whose life and teachings can transform our world. And hope is experiencing the God who continues to break into our lives and surprises us with moments when we have no doubt that God is with us. Buchner wrote, let preachers speak out of the living truth of their own experience. Friends, I trust that we are never alone and that God is working in the world in ways that brings new life each day. I hold hope as I open my eyes and my heart to witness what God might do to us and with us and through us. And I pray that God might work in you to hold hope in your heart too. We light the candle of hope and we trust that Christ brings hope 
to our world. Thanks be to God. Amen. In hope, in anticipation, and with joy, let's join in singing together. Please join me as we come before God in prayer. God of hope, God of each new day, you are our God and we are your people. We come to you this morning holding hope, praying that you might work in us and through us and break into our lives once again in such a way that we know that we are not alone and that there is always reason for hope. We thank you that even in times of struggle and darkness, you are with us. Let us never lose sight of that. Creating one, we don't always recognize the ways in which your people are hurting and yet it has become more ob obvious in our world. There is pain in so many places. We pray that you might inspire all of your children to work even harder for peace, to find common ground that unites us as people. We pray for those for whom the weather has caused damage and lost lives. We pray for those who go hungry this day and every day. Help us to reach out in hope and with compassion that we might feed bodies and spirits. God of this journey, today we recognize that many on the journey are struggling. We lift our prayers today for those who are ill and trying to gain their strength. We pray for those who find this season to be one of pain and loneliness. We pray for those who are grieving and for those who feel alone in the darkness. We pray for those who are so seriously impacted by the coronavirus. And we give thanks for the countless people who are giving so much in an effort to bring healing and hope. 
God, as we hold hope, we come to you now with the silent prayers of our hearts. God, you surround us and you hear our every prayer. Help us to come to you often and hear us as we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, I remind you that at 11.30 we will celebrate the Sacrament of Communion over Zoom, and I encourage you to come if you are able and to extend the invitation to a friend. Today we lit the candle of hope, and I recognize that for some it is so difficult to hold hope. Trust that God is with you. Know that there are others who are holding you in prayer and recognize that Christ came to bring hope into the world, into the darkest of places. Go with hope, my friends, and know that you do not go alone. Amen. Thank you.